Thank you. Thank you very much, and welcome to EWTN Live. I'm Father Mitch Packlin. It's where we bring you guests from around the world. Today, we'll be talking with Dominican Father Brian Mullady about things we never knew about the Ten Commandments. He's going to just sort of squeeze that orange that gets all the juice out of each commandment. And before we get to that, I want to welcome the Director of Programming and Production for EWTN Radio, Mr. Tom Price. Tom, welcome here. Good to see you. Tom, what do you got to share we're with us about what, what's happened on radio? Well, we're very excited about the upcoming 2019 Catholic Radio Conference. Yep. This is our 20th annual conference. It started off, as many things do with EWTN, very humbly. Uh, I think it was in a little conference room somewhere. Now it is a big event, uh, not only for our radio affiliates across the United States, but also for people who don't have a Catholic radio station near them, and maybe they're trying to discern, gee, do I want to get involved in Catholic radio? I don't know anything about radio except how to turn it on and change the station. Well, we can teach people how to get started in Catholic radio. Uh, it, it can be done. I think there were 25 people at the second, I was at the second con mm -hmm. conference. That's all there was. Now it's a few a hundred. A lot, a lot, yes. Yep, yep. And this is a, a three-day affair. It's uh, October 23rd through the 25th at a local hotel here, the Hyatt Regency. Uh, and we always begin uh, on the first day uh, in prayer at yep. the shrine in Hansville because that's, that's the powerhouse right there. That's yep. why we get involved in Catholic radio to begin with. Otherwise, it's just a job. It's just another radio station. But no, it is a mission. So if you're going to dial into the mission, you need to get, get that supercharge. I've been giving Bible classes to the sisters up there uh, about most weeks, most mm -hmm. every week. And I always like to tell them that, you know, you're not one of the moving parts on this vehicle. But the vehicle doesn't get going without the battery giving it some energy. That that's is what exactly they are. They're right. That's exactly up. right. So in this conference, uh, we will teach people about marketing and branding, how to do fundraising, because, you know, you got to pay the bills. That's right. Uh, so there's an awful lot that people can learn. I think, personally, one of the most important things about the radio conference is the networking aspect. Mm -hmm. So somebody who is just thinking about it, just beginning the process, they can, you know, sit down and, and have a cup of coffee or, or lunch or just chat in a hallway with somebody who's been in Catholic radio for 10, 15, 20 years. And that knowledge is very valuable. And everybody that comes uh, is very generous with their advice. You know, here's how to do this so you don't have to spend six extra months trying to figure out how to fill out an FCC form. Talk to this person. Talk to this engineer. Here's how to file your 501c3 nonprofit uh, and, and all that inside uh, baseball stuff. Right. It's uh, important things and a um, lot, lot of technical stuff that scares people until they see, oh, it's not that bad. It can once be done. You get in, once you get in there. Absolutely. So and good. we have a website just for people who are interested in this, and the website is EWTNCRC.com. That stands for Catholic Radio Conference. EWTNCRC.com. It'll answer all the questions that you may want, that you may have. Great. All right. Well, thanks right. for being here. We'll keep us up on that. And we'll be back in just a couple more minutes with Father Brian Milady. So please stay with us. Thank you. Welcome back. 
you know, I used to teach Old Testament at the university and always in the tests, I would ask the students to write out the Ten Commandments. I was amazed at how many of these college students did not know but one or two maybe, maybe. and partly. Um, and so I kept repeating it in the midterm and then final. Well, tonight we have a Dominican priest and scholar who wants to talk about things you may never have known about the Ten Commandments. So please welcome a good friend of the network, a longtime friend of my own, author of the brand new book, The Decalogue Decoded, What You Never Learned About the Ten Commandments. Father Brian Milady of the Order of Preachers. Father Brian. Thank you, Father Mitch. Good to have you. There you go. Welcome. Now, first question we've got to deal with here. It reminds me of my dissertation when I gave a copy to my dad. He said, what am I supposed to do with this? I can't find these words in the dictionary. Right. What is a Decalogue? Well, I didn't really title it that. The marketers did. Oh, them but again. But the Decalogue comes from the word for ten words. Yes. In, in Greek. Right. And, of course, the ten words, because basically, you know, you know this better than I do with the Hebrew language, it tends to be reduced to one, one or two words, right. basically. Right, right. Yeah, you can summarize the commandments with the first two words right. or so. Right, right. And so the Decalogue is just another fancy word for the Ten Commandments, yep. right? Yep, mm -hmm. yep, yep, yep. Right. In fact, on your cover, you have uh, you know, Moses holding the tablets with the Hebrew written out. Um, of course, it is late Hebrew script. Uh, not paleo, but that's all right. No, that's all right. I wouldn't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, one of the things I'd like you to start off with is in the beginning of the book, you try to place the role of the Ten Commandments in the purpose of being human, to be made in the image and likeness of God, and that the commandments are not these arbitrary rules that this is a test. I said this is a test. No, it's about something that goes to the core of who we are. Talk first about why it is so important for our identity as human beings to live the Ten Commandments. Well, you probably had the experience like you're hearing confessions and you talk about the adultery and uh, the fact that these people, they shouldn't sleep together before they get married. And they'll go, well, I know it is a rule. And he went, well, it's a little more than a rule. Yeah. Which suggests it's like we have to get up at 5 o'clock in the morning kind of rule. Yeah. Uh, the Ten Commandments if you, were... If you, if you get up at 5.10, that's not even a purgatory rap. No, no. Well, remember, when Adam and Eve committed the sin, because it was committed with their moral self, both our intelligence and our will was involved. And so the two principal punishments for the original sin are ignorance in the intelligence and malice in the will. Well, when God began to progressively prepare the human race for the coming of Jesus, he did this progressively, first of all, by teaching us our need for a redeemer. Because yes. if it had happened immediately, people might not have thought they needed a redeemer. So the first moment in that was the Torah, basically. Mm -hmm. It was the revelation from God of what human life was supposed to be like. Now, many of the, as we know, many of the commandments can be discovered by natural reason. Yep. But to discover them all perfectly as ten and, un, and be able to explain them all in their depth, that's something that human beings had a great deal of difficulty doing, even by the natural law. So God yeah, the chose. natural law, you can understand easily, thou shalt not steal. I don't want you to steal from me, so I shouldn't steal from somebody else. Right. That makes but sense. But how do you define theft and all those right. kind of things, how it differs from borrowing, that sort of thing. So anyway, um, the first progressive part of that revelation was to teach us the truth. Paul says the law was given to us by angels to teach us the truth. But that pointed out even further what our malice was like, because grace wasn't given to us for us to live the truth in the Old Testament. However, it's important for us to know what's taught in the Old Testament because Jesus, he abrogated some of the applications to Israel, like the ceremonial laws and the, 
the, the very strict the interpretation of the laws, mm -hmm. those kinds of things. But he didn't abrogate the Ten Commandments. And so one of our big difficulties since Vatican II, I'm sure you've experienced this too in hearing confessions, is that people don't know how to examine their consciences anymore. Yeah. So they'll come and say something's a sin when it's not. Or my favorite is, my last confession was eight years ago, I wasn't very loving. Well, well what do I do with that? Was it an idle word? Was it murder? Was, what do you mean by I wasn't very loving? And the canons of the Council of Trent are still in effect that for a confession to be integral and absolution to be given and valid, all remembered mortal sins have to be confessed kind and number. Mm -hmm. So kind has to do with what the commandments are instructing us in, and also that that has to do with how our intellect, our will, our passions, our body relate to things like first God, then other people, especially our parents, then food and drink, uh, food and drink, uh, uh, life, and then you go to kind of concentric circles. So you have life, then you have marriage, you know, the, uh, and sexuality, then you have goods, and then finally you have someone's good name. Mm -hmm. And then the last two address the issue of our malice, lust. Mm -hmm. What causes these things to occur? Sure. But it, it has to do with what's deep-seated in us in the far as the way we were created by God. Right. So it's more than just a rule. Yeah, it, right. it's one of the point. I think you make a good point in that introduction that this is a way to get us back to what we're supposed to be. Right. You know, that, that we are meant to have a good relationship with God, a good and just relationship with our neighbor, right. and a good interior sense of who we are. For the right reasons. Right, for the right, right. reasons. Mm -hmm. so all of mm -hmm. this is part. Now, given that that's the purpose, and I think for po folks to realize this is... Uh, I mean, I've even heard people say, well, the church just gives us these Ten Commandments so they can have uh, control over us. They tell us what to do. That's not it at all. No. It's about what you are to become in God's eyes and by His grace. Well, and it reflects a, a strange attitude about revelation, too. Yeah, well. These are revealed to us by God as a grace to help us to understand. Yeah. The church didn't make these up. These come, well, I know it, I suppose there's a way of interpreting this, but it, I, we were just reading the readings in Mass about the giving of the law right. to Moses, and it's by the finger of God that Moses has these things revealed to him. Right. And, and, uh, so, mm -hmm. and, and so this is the, the starting point. Now, what we want to do is take a look at some of the individual commandments. So what relevance, uh, you know, we hear even in civil law, well, the Constitution is an 18th century A.D. Mm -hmm. uh, document, so and they start to think that's outdated. This is 13th century B.C. Right. These are, the Ten Commandments are from uh, 3,300 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, what's the relevance of the first? Let's start off with the first commandments. Well, the relevance of the first commandments has to do with establishing the primary worship of Israel. And of course, as you know, that's rooted in monotheism. Deut Deuteronomy is very clear about that. Mm -hmm. One God. With one, one God. One, one God. Because, and one means one. Right. Because if there were many gods, first of all, there couldn't be a father of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. So it's a preparation for the Messiah. Mm -hmm. The first two commandments have to do with defects. Because, you know, we have this famous idea, it actually comes from Greek philosophy, but virtue stands between two extremes. Mm -hmm. So the virtue that the first three commandments are discussing is the justice that we owe to God as the supreme one being that's not a part of this world to whom we all in justice owe recognition, which is the virtue of religion. Mm -hmm. The first commandment seeks to do away with excessive religion. Now you might say, how can you be excessive in religion? The way you can do that is that you worship someone who doesn't deserve to be worshipped. Mm -hmm. So that could be idolatry. It could be people. Remember, the Romans used to worship their emperors. Mm -hmm. uh, something like that. So it, and also superstitious practices. We ask from Satan. You know, we do satanic rituals to find out the future. Uh, Ouija boards, soup, all this Astrology. stuff. Astrology. Astrology. Matter of fact, it, it's, you, it's hard to even find 
any newspaper. They're so cynical about Christianity. But every newspaper in the country carries the horoscopes. Well, and you know, too. It's sort of odd for people to think that religion is a problem. Well, well you know, too, uh, when I was in, a child in the 50s, if you talk about witchcraft, I would have thought you were insane. Right. But witchcraft is apparently live and well among us so. in the Western Very world. So. And especially in the middle cl uh, classes. Right. And among the college educated. Right. The second commandment are people who have a defect in religion, which means that they recognize the true God, but they don't worship him as he should be worshiped. Mm -hmm. The primary way that happens is when we call God as the first truth to witness to something we know to be false mm -hmm. in an oath. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why taking the name of the Lord in vain isn't like cussing. Cussing is impolite. But taking the name of the Lord in vain means calling upon God to witness, especially in court, mm -hmm. to something you know to be false. Also tempting God is an example of that. Mm -hmm. Sacrilege is an example of that. And simony. Well, some people think we have simony today the buying of ecclesiastical offices and things like that. Mm -hmm. All those aren't worthy. And then in the third commandment, we establish what the virtue of religion demands of us. And the catechism is clear. There are four acts, two interior and two exterior. Devotion in the will, prayer in the intellect, and then adoration, genuflecting, things like that, and sacrifice. Yeah, okay. and, and I think just so we... You know the commandments pretty well, but again, some of the former students I had may still not have remembered their tests. So when you say, uh, you know, that like, like the third commandment, um, you know, you're talking about the commandment that says you shall keep, keep holy, holy, holy the, the Sabbath. Sabbath. Right. And the Christian way, of course, to keep holy the Sabbath is primarily, but it does involve adoration and devotion interiorly. Uh, uh, prayer and adoration exteriorly is sacrifice, and that's the sacrifice of the Mass. Mm -hmm. So it isn't, well, I just don't go to church because I don't get anything out of it. Oh. It's a matter of justice where we try to recognize God as having given us something whom we can never repay. I, I recently said in a sermon at my the local parish where I help out that uh, uh, some people have told me that they find God more when they're out playing a game of golf and being in nature than when they're in church. But then, having heard some of what they say, it's not the hymns of praise that are coming out of their mouths when they're on the golf course and they miss a ball. Well, that's certainly true. And, uh, and they might be not only infringing the, what their duty to God is to worship on, on uh, Sunday, but they also are messing up the second commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, because that's exactly what they're doing, uh -huh. you know, and, and asking God to do some terrible things to that poor ball when it was their fault right. that they missed. That's right, absolutely. But, you know, it's the sacrifice of Christ on the cross that we have to be present at, and that's central to all worship now. Yes. So that's why it's commanded and it's a mortal sin not to go. Right. Um, and, and, and again, we're recover. I think we're in the process of recovering from um, some of the foolishness. That, that it was really uh, an adolescent approach to the commandments from some priests and nuns and religion teachers who said, well, you don't have to go to church on Sunday. Right. You know, they would say that in classes. Mm -hmm. I, I know students that heard such a thing. Right. And, you know, we we have to pull back from that nonsense and say, no, this is what God said he requires. Keep holy the Sabbath. Now, these are the commandments that deal with God. There's only one God. Can't take his name in vain or worship him in a bad way. And you have to keep holy the Sabbath and adore him. We owe the creator mm -hmm. our existence and we therefore owe him worship. The rest of the commandments have to deal with human beings. Right. So talk a little bit about what they require. Well, the fourth commandment is like religion. It's trying to repay someone we can never repay in justice. Mm -hmm. And that uh, primarily it involves your parents. You can never repay your parents for the gift of life. Mm -hmm. And also your country. Patriotism is connected to it. That's in right. A way. 
because we all grew up in a certain culture in a certain country and we recognize the fact that if we had peace and order in our society that's something we try to repay the country for but it even extends to what we would call significant uh, you know I, I always point out to the students teachers are a part of this <laughs> you could never repay them totally for what they give you right but uh, it has to do with positive actions all the others have to do with respecting rights that people have and not rights that we gave them rights that God gave them. That's right. And, and we recognize those rights in our civil laws, but we don't make them. We don't make justice and injustice in this and, and it's important to note that the state has no power to give those rights to us. They're well, given by God, and the state has therefore no power to take, take them, them away. away. Right. We, we, we recognize them and we promote them, but we're not the origin of the doctrine of those rights. Now, the right to property, for instance, there's a, a lot of dis distinctions you have to make there. But the fact that people need goods, material goods, and they have a right to their own, that's something which is by divine right. How that's lived out in property is something that results from original sin, and it also has to do with civil writs and those kinds of things. So for example, there are people who can forego private property, their right to it, if they're especially good, and that would be those of us who embrace the vow of poverty, yeah. where we have corporate property but not personal property is right. the thing. But um, the right to life is the most basic of all human rights, and no constitution, no state, no monarch, no king, no emperor can give that right to us. It's ours because we have a reasoning soul. And that's where our right. Declaration of Independence states that we have the unalienable right to life right. and liberty and pursuit of happiness from the Creator. I mean, that's in right. our document. Right. I mean, the state of Illinois just removed the right to life from uh, any fertilized egg right. or, or embryo or fetus. They said they do not have rights because women have a right to have an abortion, and that right there can't be any trumps. such right. Now, this is an, a no. law that's evil from people who think in an evil way. Right. Remember, law is an ordinance of reason. And if it's false, it's not a law. It's the usurpation of law. Right. But um, in, even in England, where they don't have a written constitution, they still have to recognize the right to life of their citizens mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the same thing. And, and, and then, of course, the right to uh, marriage is connected to that because marriage is connected to the right to life. Now, we've done away with that connection with contraception. As soon as you remove childbearing from marriage, what are you left with? Why not have homosexual? Why not have all this stuff? Because it's not about life or childbearing or anything like that. Right. That was the biggest crazy thing that began in the 18th century with Malthusianism and the French Revolution. Uh, yeah, ma and so folks know Thomas Malthus was a minister. A British, yeah, uh, minister. Brit an, an English. Uh, a uh, philanthropist. A philanthropist, an English minister, who said that uh, population is increasing geometrically and, there, and food in, uh, it does not. And therefore, there will, the population will be bigger than the food production and so we got to have wars to kill some people off. And that was in like 1800, yeah, you know, the right. earth. But he, he did that out of a good motive, a benevolent motive. But it was, he didn't, you know, he destroyed the whole idea of marriage and that. But it didn't get embraced till the churches, as you know, until the Anglicans started in the 1930s. And one of the other things that mm. is ironic is science proved him wrong. Right. Because you can increase food exponentially, sure. you know, with, sure. with scientific research. Right. Well, and then uh, that has all these things to do with family life, which is the basic building block of society. And I don't know about your opinion, but the commandments concerning family life are the things that are most attacked in both the state and, unfortunately, in some cases, in some of the members of our churches today. Yes. And without the family, it all falls down like a house of That's cards. Right. That's right. right. No, this is... Uh, and the the attack on the family and the, the rejection of the Sixth Commandment and the ramifications 
of adultery. It's not just adultery, is no. it? It no. includes any uh, you know, use of sexuality apart from the procreative Ch children and the uh, element of commitment to a person. It's not just whether you love them or not. Right. It's well, a commitment to the children that will be born and to the spouse that will raise them with you. Right. We've always thought that you don't have to have the intention to have a child in every marital act, but right. you can't exclude it. Right. 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 And um, because it's, it's about the creation of the soul. And of course, God created the world so people will go to heaven. Now, we can't put people in heaven if they're no people. <laughs> yeah. So the fact of the existence of people is central to the reason God created the world. And we're a part of that. Right. Okay. Right. But, uh, and then, of course, you go into property, which is economics is another huge area of dissent now. And the church has always condemned both communism and ultra liberal capitalism, which is the idea that proper, only profit is important or no one has a right to any property whatsoever. The state owns it all or mm -hmm. somebody else owns it all. Well, no, we have a right to property. We have a right to use it, but and always recognizing that there are higher values. So you remember the famous idea of the universal destination of goods, which is what we embrace in voluntary poverty. In case of obvious and urgent necessity, like someone's gonna die if they don't eat, and you know, a person's charging you money and you don't have the money, it's not theft to eat to save your life, that right. kind of thing, because right. that trumps it. But the whole business that turns around the economic order, uh, just wages, very important, all those things. Yeah, that if you're an employer, you have to pay people in a way that is appropriate to what they do to help you increase your profit. Right. And the, the value that they, uh, that they increase for you has to be properly compensated. But if you're a worker, you also have an equal moral obligation, obligation. to give a just honest and just day's work. work. Right. It's and in mutual. Fact, so you can commit theft by taking what belongs to somebody or by not paying them the wage that they need to survive. It doesn't have to be well but to survive, mm -hmm. you know. And then, of course, you have the right to the good name, and we talked about this today already. I, I often wonder, does anyone tell the truth today? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a problem. There's, there's a problem, problem with, with truth, period. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You wonder how people could just blatantly lie, and, and uh, I never did that, but we could prove you did it. Well, no, I never did it. Well, <laughs> but the video says you did it. That's right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and th this is uh, on lots and lots of realms. Um, and th this is uh, uh, the, the idea of being required before God and being someday judged by God for what you say in court. This is extremely important. You know, that you, I, you don't swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God, and then lie. Well, I'm not sure you're allowed to say so help you God anymore. <laughs> well, let them stop. Uh, right, right. But it also includes the... Because I need God's help. I God know. is the source of truth. Jesus yeah. personifies truth. Well, he is I true. Need, he is true. I need his, God's help to tell the truth, but right. he will hold me accountable exactly. if I don't give that but truth. But that includes judges judging properly. Yes. It includes attorneys acting according to the uh, properly. And, you know, in the Middle Ages, they used to say that the accused had to tell the truth, totally. Mm -hmm. Well, it's true, but, for example, if someone asks you to plead and you plead not guilty now mm -hmm. because of the rules of evidence that have changed since the Middle Ages, a judge doesn't have a right to directly question a defendant. He has to do so through a lawyer. And if I say I'm not guilty, it doesn't mean I didn't do it. It means it's the burden of proof in a court. Right to prove that That's I right. did it. Right. right. Uh, and we have, to, it, the, we, we have to take a break now, but you know, it, it's important to mention this is a start, and the catechism and your book very developed, really yeah. develop out you know, how if you are a politician and you take a bribe, right. this isn't just sort of getting a wink and a nod and getting away with something. 
you've broken the seventh commandment, thou shalt not steal. That's a form of stealing. And you may not take bribes. You'll answer to God for that. So these right. are things that we want to see people think through and make application, not only to their confession preparation, but to the way they make decisions. And this is why we want to talk more about this and get some of your comments and comments from our studio audience. So please stay with us and we'll be back with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, this is a great time of celebration today, of course, is St. Ignatius of Loyola Feast Day, big day for us Jesuits. And uh, it's great to be celebrating with a Dominican. Oftentimes, oh, yes, Dominicans are. and Jesuits would share their feast days together. But also this past Saturday, I celebrated my 70th birthday. Uh, it was a great time. As a matter of fact, uh, take a quick look. I had two cakes. Happy birthday. So uh, pretty soon they're going to need three cakes. There's enough candles there. <laughs> but it's, uh, it was a great time. A lot of folks from EWTN, parishes and stuff. So it's right. a good, good time. And, uh, you know, just en enjoyed it very much. And to tell you the truth, I enjoy getting older. It's fun. Uh, she considers some of the alternatives. So you ready for some questions? All right. Let's get you up. We'll start off with Bob. Bob, where are you calling from? Yes, hi, good evening, and happy happy uh, 70th birthday, uh, Father Thank Mitch you. And, and Brian. I'm calling from Northern Virginia, and Great. I have uh, two quick questions. First one is I'm just curious whether all of the uh, the commandments are mortal sins, you know, depending upon, of course, if they have the right intent or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I noticed that Father Brian mentioned that, you know, if you miss Mass, it's a, it's a mortal sin. But is there an issue of gravity when we're looking at these mortal sins? Is, is there a difference between someone who misses Mass on Sunday and someone who murders somebody or commits adultery mm -hmm. or some other, other sin that uh, another one of the Ten Commandments, I'm just listing those. So how do, how do we weigh that when we're talking? Do you, go to, do you go to hell if you miss Mass on Sunday? I mean, how does that all work? Sure. It's somewhat frightening. All right. That's, uh, let's take a look at that. First of all, all Ten Commandments are breaking all Ten Commandments a uh, mortal sin? Well, you can't answer this question simply. Right. Because some commandments admit a smallness of matter. For example, theft. Right. To take an apple from a fruit stand is nothing. On the other hand, to extort $1,000 from somebody is a mortal sin. Yes, you can go to hell for that. Yeah. Um, and and e even then, you have to also consider something else. If you steal a dollar 
from a person right. who is absolutely destitute. Right. That's all they have to live See, on. So you can't answer those questions simply. Right. What right. you can say, though, is that the serious violation of all ten of the commandments, yes, can send you to hell. Right. Is there a, a gradation? Yeah. Dante's Inferno has gradations, but everybody's still in hell. Right. You remember the top corners are the lustful right. because they still love somebody. But the bottom of the pit of hell is ice because they're the betrayers and they not only didn't love anybody, but they hated those who loved them. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, if, if it's true that God commands these things in truth, if it's a serious violation of the truth and the church has determined that not being present at the sacrifice of Christ. Now, now again, you know, Father, I missed Mass on Sunday. Oh, really? Yeah, I had a broken leg and I was in the hospital. Well, I'm sorry. It's willful, right? You know, yeah, yeah, that's has not to be deliberate. Sin. That's not a sin. Or if you, you know. have a sick child or a sick uh, member of the family, and you, can't you must get away. Ca sure. care for. Sure. There's no sin in right. that. But you can't make, you can't ask questions like that and have a simple answer. But if you're violating the thing seriously, God seriously made these for a reason. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the Jews consider the Sabbath so important mm -hmm. that uh, you must know this much better than I do. They're, what is they're arguing now in Tel Aviv about whether you take a bus to the beach right. on the Sabbath without violating the Sabbath rest right. or something like That's that. Right. So our experience of attending Mass on Sunday, if it's not, if it's not through your own fault, if it emphasize how important this is to recognize God's rights over you. God has rights over us. Right. And, and um, you know, when you think about missing Mass, you miss Mass because, oh, I just, I don't need to go. You know, if you make a willful decision sure. to say, uh, I'm, there's an exemption clause with my name on it. Right. No, 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 there's not. Right. Uh, the ten, uh, the sixth commandment about adultery. Uh, yeah, it's bad for other people, but I, God doesn't want right. if I do it. No, 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 no can't no, go there. No. So you have to take them very seriously, and the the grave matter in each one uh, must right. be taken very seriously. I mean, lying obviously admits of. I mean, there are small lies and there are big lies. Yeah. A small lie would be a venial sin, but yeah. a big lie. You know, that's no uh, uh, example that would that be send you to hell. I, yeah. If I say I saw Father Milady kill somebody, perjury in court, and, and I'd be lying, offense. I'd be lying. About a capital and offense. he would go to uh, to the death uh, uh, chair, the, the, mm. the electric chair. That would be a huge. I've killed him. No, yeah. you know that the, there's very serious lies. Sure. And uh, even if it's just to get you out of trouble, right. it's not good enough right. reason. Take a question from our studio audience. Father, where are you from? Well, Father Bill Lee Miller from Davenport, Iowa, and glad to be here. And I have a question, though, for the good fathers about just a real practical question on the moms and dads who are there on an average night, uh, 7 or 8 o'clock at night, watching TV. Maybe they're not watching EWTN every night, but say they have a secular movie on, and increasingly they're breaking more and more of the commandments. What do you tell those parents and say, look, this is serious matter. It's just not a film or it's not just not play acting, but something that's going to touch the hearts, the lives of your kids, your young kids, the teenagers. It's something more than just a film, something that's going to affect who they are. So it would be films that say glorify violence, uh, killing. It. Uh, a, adultery, fornication, drug use. I mean, these are the themes of a lot of movies. Right. And so, uh, is there something sinful about that? Is that what you're asking? As you know, the movies have increasingly gone downhill to where oh, yeah. how many Ten Commandments can they break in a given movie? Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't go. Uh, but What's anyway, go ahead. Well, I, I would say that you you need to be aware of the images and their effect, especially on children. If you're an adult and you feel it's not going to affect you, well, fine. But if you're a, if you're guarding your children, you need to be aware that images are serious business. I remember I was watching the movie Braveheart once with a, a man, mm -hmm. and his little son was there, and we didn't, you know, it's it's not a evil movie or anything, but it does have battle scenes in it from the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. And battle scenes that can be quite 
graphic. Yes. Well, the little kid finally started to cry, and we said, oh, wait, we can't watch this while he's here, you know. Right. You need to be aware that images do have a lot of effect. Right. It's a movie about courage and, and right. patriotism. But, but the battle scenes can be quite, yeah. you know, for a little And, and I, 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 sometimes you'll hear from the Hollywood people, well, you know, this doesn't really get anybody to do anything bad. They don't, that's phony baloney. Um, they spend millions of dollars on 30 second commercials to make us change our minds right. about what soap and all these other products that we use. And they think that that 30 seconds will have an impact. Right. But then their two hour movie won't. Right. Right. I know I may look stupid, but I'm not that stupid. Right, exactly. They, the movies do have an impact. Right. And they are lying through their teeth, especially when you know, there was just a, a, a series that was meant to be, I don't know if it was entertainment or education, I don't know what they had in mind, but they had kids who were planning to commit suicide. And then yeah. kids started committing suicide imitating the television Oh, show. I think that was a series on Yeah, it was TV. a series. Yeah. And, you know, they said, it has an impact. Right. So you stay away from the nasty stuff. Right. I have another caller. Hello, Jack. Hello. How y'all are today? Fine, thanks. Where are you from? I'm from God's country, Lafayette, Louisiana. Huh. Oh, well. Well, that's where God goes wading up to his ankles. Right. So. <laughs> that's right. You have been down the... That's I right. know that's true. So what you got for us uh, as a question, Jack? Well, first of all, before I, I, I give you my question, it's an honor and a pleasure to speak to both a Jesuit and a Dominican at the same time. Well, look at that. Thank you. Uh, That's very kind. Thank it's you, ecumenism Jack. in the church. <laughs> right. It's a real honor to speak to both of you gentlemen. Um, Father, my question is very simple. I love relics, okay? Um, the actual stones that God created on Mount Sinai, do those stones still exist as a relic somewhere in the world? And if they do, where are they located and can the public um, adore them? That's what I needed to know. Oh, no, that's your question. You're in the Holy oh, Land. Okay. Yeah, you've been in the Holy Land a lot. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. In the book of Maccabees, it mentions that the prophet Jeremiah, who was a priest, remember that? He, was, he and the prophet Ezekiel were both priests as well as prophets. And the Maccabees mentions that the prophet Jeremiah took the commandments and hid them on Mount Nebo over on uh, in what's now Jordan. Now, there are a lot of people who claim to have them uh, or have seen them. Uh, there was one guy who said he saw them in Saudi Arabia. Another guy said that he was excavating on uh, Mount Nebo, and he saw them. And then another guy says he saw them in the Temple Mount in a, in a cistern. And somebody else, a lot of people say that they, they're over in Ethiopia. But they don't give us any photographs and a chance to take a look at the script and everything else. Uh, so in archaeology, uh, you have to show the concrete evidence, or in this case, the stone evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to have it. And you can't say, well, I saw it, but I, I just didn't get a picture of it. No, 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 that doesn't count. So what we'd have to do is find them. Right now, nobody knows exactly where they are. There are all these claims, but nobody knows where they are, and they remain hidden. And if you take a look at the end of chapter 11 in the book of Revelation, you'll see that right before Our Lady appears with clothed in the sun, that the Ark of the Covenant is revealed from heaven. And it's interesting that one of the titles of Our Lady, especially in the Holy Land, is Our Lady, the Ark of the New Covenant. And so to go from seeing that Ark at the end of chapter 11 to seeing the woman clothed with the son who gives birth to a, uh, a, a, a baby boy who then ascends to heaven, 
um, th that's meant to be a direct connection. So take a look at that, and we'll just sort of have to wait and see whatever happens to them. And remind me, they, they certainly weren't in the Temple of Herod. No, 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 no. Were no, they no. even in they, the second temple? Uh, no, 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 they were not. That's they right. were uh, so the, it was empty. the they first were temple holy, holy, uh, that holy. Solomon yeah. built, the, the Ark, the Ark of the was Covenant there. was there. Mm -hmm. uh, when the temple was destroyed in 587, August of uh, 9th of 587, mm -hmm. then the, then they, they disappeared. They were lost. Yes, they disappeared, mm -hmm. and that's where they say Jeremiah. That's where Raiders Indom. of the Lost Ark comes in, right? That, well, that, and then oh, <laughs> I almost forgot. And Indiana Jones saw him in yeah. Egypt. <laughs> With his Nazi friends. No, 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 no. So, uh, <laughs> and they're in a big warehouse in Washington, run by the Masons. Right. I don't know. No, so, no. It, 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 don't worry about that stuff. We, um, there are plenty of other copies in your own Bible. You can check them out there. We've got lots of Exodus relics. chapter 20 and Deuteronomy right. chapter 5. Check, check those copies of the Ten Commandments. That's the All important right. part. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Toronto, Canada. Wonderful. Love having you folks come from uh, Canada. It's yeah. delightful. And what is your question? My question, fathers, is when you raise a family uh, according to the teachings of the church, as you promise when you baptize your children, and then they grow up, and so society dilutes those teachings. So either they fall into wanting to live together or having the honeymoon before they have their marriage vows. <laughs> What do you do as a parent or a parishioner of, of other families, children, not to judge them, because and then you fall into a sin of, of judgment, H how to bring them back into the teachings of the church so that they are on the right path? All right, well, first of all, judging someone's actions is not a sin. This, the judgment that's condemned ah, by you Christ. Wait, she likes that. She likes no, that. No, no, the judgment that's condemned by Christ is rash judgment. Yeah. Where you judge with little evidence or you, whatever. Um, or, or if you try to judge whether somebody's in hell or in something. Yeah, and it's very difficult even to judge intentions. We don't even know our own intentions, much less other people. But actions you can certainly judge. And if you uh, think that what they're doing is sinful and it's harmful, uh, provided, now you don't think it's going to make them more hardened in their doing it mm -hmm. because I don't know I, I don't know about you I find correcting family members to be the worst possible thing because it just ensures they're going to do it more yeah. um, there's a, a line in St. Thomas where he talks about fraternal correction and he said should we correct our brothers and of course your family would be very close to you as your brothers he says yes we do have an obligation to do that on the other hand the purpose of correction is the amendment of the offender and if you're pretty sure because of who you they, who you are and who they are and the manner in which it's done, that it would just increase the offense, then you have an obligation to keep quiet because you won't be achieving the purpose of the thing anyway. Right. Now, we can certainly judge that living together, we think is, uh, and they weren't raised that way, we think is contrary to the commandments and it's not doing them any good. And in fact, it's pretty clear from evidence that so-called trial marriages Fail. Fail. Mm -hmm. the, the, that experiment doesn't work out. Right. The, the, uh, like, uh, high, the average, no, I think, what, about 50% of marriages uh, end up in divorce. But right. when people live together before marriage, it's 60%. Something like that, yeah. But anyway, if a person felt comfortable doing this and they felt the person might listen, they can certainly say, look, I, I'm very concerned. I... I don't understand why you're doing this. Um, it, it's not where we raised you. Uh, and just as a loving attempt to try to show them that you're worried about the fact that they'd be destroying their own humanity, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but you, you can certainly make judgments about people's deeds, sure. not sure. about their intentions. They may not mean it, but. Uh, and, uh, and I think you know, in this realm, we have to take a look at the catastrophe that this has turned into in our oh, country. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, right now, 52% of all children are born out, out of, of wedlock. wedlock. Right. 52%. And am I saying that because, oh, that is so naughty. No, I'm saying it because I care about those kids. And that is being born out of wedlock 
is the number one indicator that those kids will be poor and that the woman will probably be poor. It's number one indicator that they will, the kids will not finish high school. They will use drugs. They will, they're much more likely to end up in jail. And they are also more likely to become parents out of wedlock and continue the cycle. 60% of the girls, and no one studied the boys, I suspect it's higher. That's the re This is the facts of life. Well, and also, to be a whole human being, well-formed, you need the love of both parents that are both committed to you. Right. And that's what the marital relationship's all about. I mean, exactly. the natural argument for the fact that husbands and wives have to stay together for a long time, it's not the, the sacramental one, but it's that, you know, you can form a bird in one year, but a human child takes 20. Yeah. So you can't just have people who are jumping back and forth. And both the man and the woman and the way they love are both extremely important. The woman in the primary years, the man in the, in the adolescent years. In the Affirmation. And why do people feel unaffirmed today, unloved? They don't believe they love except because of what they do. Right. Divorce is one of the primary reasons. And, this other, and being born out of wedlock. And the whole thing about no child but a wanted child, what does that mean? I have a child because he fits into my life. Not because it's right. a gift from the hands of a loving creator, but because yeah. it fits into my convenience. And I would oh. dare suggest that the majority of the human race was probably not planned. Right. All right, I want to encourage you all to get Father Milady's book. It's called The Decalogue Decoded. What you never learned about the Ten Commandments is by Father Brian Milady. You can get that from EWTNRC.com. That's our religious catalog. And it is item number 81036. Uh, great for you to get a hold of that and also read the Catechism on the, the Ten Commandments. It's some Excellent. fantastic mm -hmm. reflections, fantastic development. Uh, that, and this is a, a great work to go along with it. Father Brian, it's so good Thanks to have you back. Thanks for having me again, Father Mitch. Yeah, it's a mm -hmm. delight if you would join me in uh, blessing everybody. Okay. May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you. The Amen. Father, the, the Son, Son and, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You know, Father Brian, you've been doing shows here for how many years? Um, the first one was like 89, I think. Yeah, so that's, that's starting to add up. Right. Oh, that's a good <laughs> 30 years. And, you know, this network is getting close to being 38 years old. Um, Mother was inspired that it would be run or, and by you. So the way to do that is to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, your cable bill. We have a lot of bills, especially in the summertime. Uh, bill collectors don't stop. So continue to help us out, and we appreciate it. God bless you all.